Hello and happy holidays. We're back with another rich episode of live stream with Heritage Center. I see a couple of you have been tuned in here for a minute. So thanks for watching. We're very excited to share some wonderful holiday history with you tonight. My name is Eleni Kaler and I am the University of Dubuque Heritage Center Student Engagement Graduate Assistant. A lot of words, I know. <laughs> Seems like as you move up in the world, your title gets a little shorter. I'm getting there. <laughs> Tonight with me, I have a couple of special guests whose titles are quite short. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce them. First off is our Executive Director here at the Heritage Center, Mr. Tom Robbins, and the man you've been waiting to see, our special guest, actor Patrick Dwayne. I'll go ahead and bring Tom on first. Let's have him. Hello, Tom. Hello, Elena. Can you believe this is our seventh episode of Live Dream with Heritage Center, number seven. We've been doing this since June and doing it on a monthly basis. Most of them have been, have been musical in nature, but last month and this month, we actually have actors. So we've kind of mixed it up a little bit and we're having a, a good time with that. But one thing I wanna make sure that I say now and I don't forget is I know I, I put word out to some of our veterans and military folks in the area that we were doing this special program tonight um, that has is, is rooted in World War II and stories with World War II. So if there are any veterans out there watching our broadcast tonight, I just wanted to salute them and um, thank them for their service and thanks for tuning in tonight. So we, we hope that we have at least a few of you out there joining us tonight. So tonight we're featuring, as Elaine alluded to, Patrick Dewayne, who we had the privilege three years ago of having him live at Heritage Center in our smaller Babka Theater. And he performed a title, uh, an original show that he put together, produced and wrote um, called The Accidental Hero. And uh, we had a great time with that. I think we had full houses, two full houses with that, with those performances back in in 2017, but we have Patrick here tonight. We're gonna to ask him a few questions before we launch into some excerpts of, of a new show he has for us tonight. So let's bring Patrick on. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Hey, good, thank you. I know as we talked off screen, it's been a busy day because <laughs> you're not only performing for us tonight, but you've already had a show earlier today, correct? Up in uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, Judy Garland's hometown, yes. And you did a live stream of The Accidental Hero or of The Christmas Show? Of The Christmas Show, Waiting for the Angels, yes. Okay, okay. So as I was mentioning before you came on, Patrick, we were so thrilled when we had you back in November of, I think it was November of 2017, with The Accidental Hero. And as, as I read your biography and read like some of the credentials, you've you're probably in the multiple hundreds in terms of how many times you've done the accidental hero, aren't you? Yes. yes. And you've done it all over the country here. You've done it all over the Czech Republic. Uh, I know we mentioned offline here. How many times have you been to the Czech Republic to perform the accidental I've been hero? To, I've been to the Czech Republic every May since uh, 2013, except for, of course, 2020 when everything got shut down with COVID. Okay. So, okay. They they invited me back after the first year, and now I'm kind of in the Czech mafia. I couldn't get out if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> You've become a hero of theirs as well, I'm sure. Over they treat me very well. Thank you, thank you to my grandfather, and and right. thank you again. I mean, you mentioned there might be some vets. Thank you for your service. My grandfather was a lieutenant colonel in World War II, uh, so our family was touched uh, by his service, and uh, I thank all of you. When did you um, debut The Accidental Hero? For, well, let me step back. When, when did you start to develop it, and when did it debut, and where? It was about 10 years ago that my sister found my grandfather's writings that no one knew about in my aunt's basement, and she handed them out as, for, as Christmas presents, maybe a dozen years ago, and I couldn't I couldn't believe what, what I was reading. Grandpa refused to talk about the war 
uh, when I was growing up, I would beg him for war stories. I loved war movies, but he wasn't talking. So I have the nuns at school imagining what it was like, you know, telling me about the war. And then this guy who was there, he wasn't talking. Of course, I didn't understand why that was. I, I, I now have a much better idea uh, wh why that was. So she found this, handed it out as Christmas presents. And then, uh, and then I would tell bits of it like at parties or to friends, and people would always say, that really happened? I'd say, yeah. And they say, someone should make a movie out of that. I said, yeah, someone should. <laughs> yeah. And then one day, one day the voice said, what are you waiting for? Right? And I'm like, what do you mean? Is to write a script. I'm like, uh, write a script? So to quiet the voice, I wrote a script. Uh, I, I read it first. I read it for about a year to different groups. Uh, and then I got a gig at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, oh. Someone came to see a perf performance that I did. So I, I, I mean, right off the back, it's a wonderful gig at, at Notre Dame, had a residency there. Um, and then kind of one thing led to another, word of mouth. I did it down at the, the George H.W. Bush Museum and Library uh, on, on the campus of uh, Texas A&M. I then got a gig out at the uh, the Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. was down in New Orleans at the National World War II Museum. And then and then I got a gig through the uh, library system of Minnesota, where I did it in about 45 libraries all over the state. Wow. And then that, that then got it to the point where it was on the radar of the various presenters in the state of Minnesota. And then I got an agent. And then I started taking it to the Czech Republic. So it's all just sort of built over time. So you said it started really percolating about ten years ago. Yeah, about ten years ago. So that'd be 2010. So when did you when did you really premiere, or when was the Notre Dame gig? The Notre yeah. Dame gig. Notre Dame gig was the year before that. 2000, oh. 2010 was was then when I, I got a uh, a touring grant. A touring grant through a new program that they had in Minnesota. There was all of this money that became available for the arts. And they had a touring program and they wanted, they particularly wanted people to go to hard to reach places and where they might not have a performing arts center. So I connected with some of them through some Czech communities in those communities. So it, it was attractive, I think, because of that. They liked the subject matter. They liked that it had to do with veterans because they didn't have a whole lot of programming about that. So then, so then all of that then got the attention of uh, of the Minnesota presenters, and then the Wisconsin presenters, and then the Iowa presenters, and okay. then going to the conferences. Well, before we launch into the first excerpt of of a new show that you've developed, kind of a sequel to the Accidental Hero, for those who weren't fortunate enough to be there with us at the Heritage Center three years ago, can you give us kind of a little Cliff Notes version of The Accidental Hero. Would love to, Tom. It's about my grandfather, uh, Matt Cunup, who uh, grew up on a farm in Wisconsin where Czech was his first language. He didn't learn English until he was six. And that's that's germane to this whole story. So he ends up being in the uh, Second Infantry Division, came across on Omaha Beach, ended up being a hero in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he had to lead a group of cooks and drivers to stop an SS Panzer tank uh, attack. Uh, and then um, on near the end of the war, the, the end of April, uh, his division of all of the divisions in the army was given the assignment to liberate southern Czechoslovakia. They were moved under George Patton's command. And my grandfather, because he spoke fluent Czech, was given the assignment to be the commander of the advanced party, to go ahead with 500 men ahead of the rest of the division, the 200 miles down to the Czech-German border, behind enemy territory. Uh, he thought that the war, he knew the war was just about over, so he thought, he was in fact packing his bags, and then he gets this assignment where he's got to go behind enemy lines. So he thought, oh, what bad luck. Well, he gets there, gets to the border, and he sees that the closest village to where they were camped, the closest Czech village, a little dot on the map of a few hundred people called Clenchy, and he recalled that that was his grandmother's home village. And then he realized that all four of his grandparents came from this little region of, of Czechoslovakia. So he decides that because he's in charge, he's the head of the 200 guys that are there, that he's going to go ahead of them on his own into Czechoslovakia just to see what it's like. 
ends up stumbling across a meeting of the local resistance in his grandmother's hometown, the first American they've ever seen. And he tells them, not just in their language, Tom, but use in their dialect, using terms that only they use, right? The first American they see, they're blowing their minds. And, and then they ask him, are, are you from here? He said, oh, my, my, my grandparents were from Clenchy and Marakov. And then they're like, we're being liberated by one of our own, right? Yeah. And then two days later, he gets to the main square of the capital district and they're waiting for him. Word had spread. Banners are up with his name on it and check saying uh, he is our liberator. Matt Conop is lib we are liberated by one of our own. And then they then here you can see this is my iPhone case. Yeah. They picked him up, put him on their shoulders and paraded him around town saying <laughs> we're liberated by one of our own. He had grown up wanting to just sort of distance himself from his Czech background thinking that, you know, he wanted to be a real American. Uh, and then he came face to face with the truth of, of where he was from and who he was. And then he embraced it the rest of his life, which didn't make any sense to me when I was growing up. I think I told you off camera that I was told that I was German, Irish, and Bohemian. And where is Bohemia on the map? When you're a kid, if it, if it doesn't make sense, you just think, Adults, they eat weird things, they listen to bad music, and they say things like Bohemia. Um, <laughs> so I didn't, have, I didn't know anything about it and had no interest in it. Um, well, and, and thus, that's why you had to discover things in his basement, probably after he had passed, I assume. 20 years, okay. 20 years after he passed. He oh, also, wow. he had one of these, uh, a handheld Kodak movie camera. <laughs> While he, wow. was, while he was in the war. So then my, so I started writing this script and I got a call from my uncle and he never called me before. And I thought, and he can be kind of a difficult uncle. I said, so I understand you wrote, wrote a script. I said, yeah. He said, well, you want to see his movies? I said, what are you, what are you talking about, Uncle Jack? Yeah, he had a movie camera. You didn't know that? Yeah, we got movies. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I've got actual footage that my grandfather took, including footage the day that he was carried on the shoulders. Unfortunately, he wasn't filming that. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to leave it to the audience's imagination. And my I've imagined that scene countless times. Wow. Probably, what, probably. What a great archive and what a fascinating story. It really was like fate, right, for this all to happen and play out for him. I think so. I think it was. So kind of flash forward then, because we want to launch into what we're here for, or part of what we're here for tonight, and that is the accidental hero helped to spawn kind of a sequel, um, which has a kind of a Christmas thread throughout it, and some more stories from your grandfather. I, I understand you actually even have film footage from some of these stories as well. That's part of the Christmas uh, sequel. But you called it, and that was news to me when you emailed us recently, that you're calling the show Waiting for the Angels. Um, we thought it was Christmas on the road, but yeah. maybe, maybe things have kind of um, evolved a little bit. Think, think, Tom, things, things have evolved. My, yeah. the, the, first, the first title for the old show was The Mushroom Picker, and then I changed it to The Accidental Hero. Right, thank you. So I'm, so I'm bad at naming things the first shot, right? Okay. My wife named our two kids, so uh, we, they keep me away from the naming. But I think I've got a good name now. And the name comes from my grandfather was not home for Christmas. The song I'll Be Home for Christmas came out during World War II. I'll Be Home for Christmas, if only in my dreams. Yeah. That is literally millions of people are living that reality, that they're over in war. The veterans who, who might be watching who are stationed someplace, they know exactly what that is about, okay? So, uh, and here's the thing, on the first Christmas, they weren't home for Christmas. The song says, I'll be home for, but they weren't home for Christmas. And, and, and the first Christmas is a little bit of a disaster movie. Um, uh, no room at the end. She's given birth with the animals and their manure. And then, boom, then suddenly the kid's born and there's angels and there's shepherds and there's kings with gold and a drummer boy and whatever else, right? Right. And, and my favorite Christmas movie is It's a Wonderful Life. OK, that is also a disaster movie movie. George jumps off of the bridge. Right. He's sure that he's got this unbearable business problem. And his solution is to jump off the bridge. And that flushes out the angel. Right. Right. So there's this thing. And then and then the angel doesn't fix his money problem. 
Clarence fixes George's George problem. George does not see the world accurately. He doesn't understand how important he is to everything else. Sure. So these stories are all about, about being an angel, having an angel, being at that place where things seem to be unbearable. And then that somehow gets you closer to this spark, right? So this first section you're going to give us a little sampling of. Yes. Is uh, the notes that I have a Christmas Eve religious service in a cellar during the Battle of the Bulge, December 24th, 1944. Correct. Start okay. with my grandfather. General Robertson asked me to find a place where we could have Christmas Eve services. I chose the basement of a bombed out tavern and word spread amongst, amongst the infantrymen and about a couple dozen joined us. Beard stubbled enlisted men who sloshed through about two inches of icy water to claim their spot on that stone floor. We were shoulder to shoulder like cattle in a barn, our bodies warming the air while our feet froze in that icy slush. Now, the men would rock from one foot to another trying to stay warm while the chaplain murmured his prayers in Latin. Now, I am Catholic and the old Latin mass comforted me, but I wondered what those who weren't Catholic, what their reaction was. But the chaplain's sermon was in English and we understood every word. My friends, like us, Mary and Joseph were not home for Christmas. They were on the move, not sure where they would stay. And 2,000 years ago, childbirth was a most dangerous situation for mother and child, particularly when it happened in a barn. Why were they alone? Where were their families? And when the innkeeper told this pregnant young woman and, and her helpless husband that there was no room for the inn and told them that they needed to stay the night in a barn to give birth surrounded by animals and no doubt their manure, well, I must be honest with you, I have never liked these crude and cruel details of our merry Christmas story. Who makes an entrance in a barn? Today, maybe this makes a little more sense. We, after all, are not home. Our families aren't here, and we are also in the midst of a most dangerous situation. Who among you would choose to spend Christmas here? Not standing in manure, although that does sound warm, doesn't it? No, we are standing in slush, and many of you will sleep in the snow tonight much like the child who slept in a manger, which is just a fancy term for a feeding trough for a cow. I watched you this morning as you, as you came down from those hills like the shepherds in the story to come here to celebrate what? A birth in a most unlikely place, light coming in at the darkest time of night. We are all here to celebrate the Prince of Peace. 
in the middle of a battlefield. My friends, the story is about us, about, about this, that even when death lurks among us, we are in a sacred place. So before you go back to your weapons and I go back to anointing the foreheads of the dead, oh, let us find peace. Amen. Merry Christmas. Let us pray. After words, the chaplain came up to me and he began to apologize for his emotions. And I cut him off and said, no, chaplain, it was perfect. You transformed a tavern cellar into a cathedral. You anointed the living this time, not just the dead. You see, in combat, your emotions aren't your friend. When we were in the Battle of the Bulge, and I had to lead a group of cooks and drivers to defend to the last man against a group of German panzer tanks. There was, there was a journalist by the name of Meyer Levin who was stranded with us. And we had to explain to him that if we were all killed and he was the last man, he wasn't to die. He was to get out the window of the bathroom and run up the hill and get to the other side. As we explain this, he just stared at us with his mouth wide open. After the war, Meyer Levin wrote that our battle was nothing like what you see in the movies. He was shocked at how calmly we went about our preparations perhaps preparing to die. Well, what, what did he expect? Paul Revere riding around in a Jeep yelling, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming. No, no. You learn to ignore your emotions. But that sermon from the chaplain, that was different. It was a grace that allowed us to live, not just survive. I brought the words of his sermon home with me after the war, and they comforted me when the war would intrude into my life and my thoughts. I would remember what he said to us when none of us knew if we were going to get out of it. The final words of his sermon in that tavern cellar were in Latin, Ite in pace, go in peace. Well, we left in peace. Thank you. Uh, very moving and insightful at the same time. So that that was that was terrific. And we're going to get back to the to the story. And you've got other. There, there's several stories that you tell in this sequel, the Accidental Hero. But but before we get back to the action, there, I want to talk a little bit about you, just as a person. So uh, we were talking a little bit offline, but you grew up in Wisconsin. Where where at in Wisconsin? Yeah, Patrick, about 35 miles from Lambeau, uh, okay. Manitowoc, Wisconsin, right on Lake Michigan. And all the way through high school, right? Mm -hmm. That's and where right. Did, and then where did you go from there? 
Uh, just upstream from Dubuque, St. Mary's and Winona. Oh, That's okay. where I went to college. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with that. And you now reside in Minnesota near the Twin Cities or where exactly? Right in the Twin Cities. Right. Okay, right. And, you know, I, I asked this question, and I don't mean to, for this to be offensive at all. I hope it won't be a, a offensive. But do you consider yourself an actor by trade? I consider myself to be a storyteller by trade. Okay. And the acting is part of that. Um, definitely. I mean, um, you're, you're very convincing and very talented. I mean, we saw that firsthand with a live show. And I'm glad, even if this is something that you're kind of doing post-retirement, that you've decided to take it on because you're impacting a lot of lives through the story and 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 through your grandfather's memory. Um, but tell us a little bit more about wh where your life path took you up, up through the accidental hero. Sure. Well, I, I, I want to go back to something Elaney was saying about how long her title was. Elaney, my first job when I was when okay. I was in grad school in New York, I was the development and marketing systems coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> what a dumb mouthful that was. Nice. I needed to have a business card about, you know, the size of a Hershey bar. Yeah, I need an index card. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I moved to New York after after undergrad and uh, uh, got for graduate school and got a uh, master's of fine arts through the theater program at Brooklyn College. Um, and uh, my my focus was in arts management. But I had been involved in theater in high school and in college. It's what I loved. We're so in very similar boats there. That's really. The, I think all three of us are. Well. Really. Yeah. <laughs> so and and when I got to New York and I thought, oh well, maybe maybe I'll get discovered. And then I realized that any given restaurant in New York City had actors that were better looking, more talented, <laughs> and could sing and dance better than I could. And I thought, well, this is a ridiculous dream. This is just never going to happen. And then my grandfather's story came along. And uh, I, I think that I needed to have the life experiences to be able to write my grandfather's show and to do that story uh, well. Um, I was fortunate to see all kinds of performances when I lived in New York. And then I moved to Philadelphia and then here in the Twin Cities. So I was always going to see things. And I, I when I lived in New York in, in, the, in the 80s, I particularly liked going to uh, what they call performance art, right? It was Spalding Gray was an Eric Bogosian, these sort of one man shows, uh, which were edgier. I mean, they were weird sort of yeah. thing. Mine isn't edgy other than it's dealing with edgy, edgy material, right? I mean, you're talking about life and death. <laughs> Um, so, and I would go there and I'd always have this voice that would say, you could do that. You could do that. And I thought, ah, right. Well, hearing then, you say that is extremely reassuring. I, I mean, I've already feel like I've learned so much from you. So it's great to hear you share these stories, um, and your personal ones as well. I, there's hope out there for kids yeah. like us, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and when I got into fundraising, I mean, it's that's storytelling as well. I mean, you you have to be able to tell a compelling story and you have to be able to engage your your donors. They have to really buy into what you're doing. Yeah. And I, I used to tell my staff, I was a head of fundraising at Minnesota Opera for 10 years and did some capital campaigns. And I used to tell them, look, we can't be boring. We, they are, they're coming from their boring lives to see opera. We need to be operatic. We need yeah. to engage. This is, about, this is about the human condition. So, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's always a, a dramatic element to, to what I was doing. Well, I <laughs> love that perspective. I, I, that's, that's just wonderful to hear. You put a smile on my face for the rest it, of the it's, year. <laughs> it's interesting to hear that, Patrick, because this semester I had a, a student that I did an independent study with kind of an intro to arts management. And we talked a lot about the story. Uh, you've got to have your story ready. Everybody's got to be on the same page with the same story. And uh, it's got to be compelling, right? That's what fundraising in the arts or fundraising for any cause. That's what it's right. all about. 
No, they in in and you can't just write it and say this is what it is, right? I mean, there's a there's a workshopping of the story, and you need your cast to really buy into it, right? Uh, whether that's your volunteers, your donors, your staff, just because you say it's going to be this, right? You know, it's like I'm the leader. Hey, anybody seen where my followers went? <laughs> We've got to have you come down and do a seminar just on that topic. No, I'd love um, to, please. But, but in in essence of of time here, I want to get back. Speaking of the story, um, we want to go to kind of part two, an excerpt of of the sequel, the Christmas sequel to the Accidental Hero. And this one is going to tell us the story of thanks thanks Eleni. This one is going to tell us the story of the American Saint Nick, and I'll let you take it from there. Okay, I'll I'll set this up because. Um, <clears throat> the American St. Nick happened in uh, just 40 miles from my grandfather's Christmas story, roughly the same time. In the country of Luxembourg, the big thing for the kids is the Feast of St. Nicholas. You know, jolly old St. Nicholas, now you dear old man. Okay, very popular in some European countries. So when, <clears throat> when the Americans got to this little town of Vilts, Luxembourg, and they found out that Hitler had banned St. Nick, right, for four years. It's just like the Grinch who stole Christmas. Hitler stole Christmas from these kids. Also stole their fathers because all the fathers were dragged into the German army or they were killed. So these poor kids, right? So, so these soldiers get there and then they decide, hey, we're bringing St. Nick back. So there was a guy that they dressed up as St. Nick. They put him in a Jeep. And it's a story that they, they made, whoops, they, they made, you can see there, there he is in a Jeep and, and he's dressed up, you know, with, with the hat. And I, you know, I, I wear this goofy hat, right? This guy by the name of Richard Brookins. So then, so then for a day, they do this thing, right? And they give out candy and donuts and they took everybody's hot chocolate, or, uh, Hershey bars and melted them down in a hot chocolate. So they do this for a day. And then, um, and then they just sort of forget about it and they move on. And then that town gets leveled. And um, but the guy who played Saint Nick comes back to the states, lives a normal life, and then uh, that's where where we will pick things up. I will be playing the guy who played uh, Saint Nick. So. I get a letter, 1977, International Airmail, with the return address of Viltz Luxembourg. Inside, eight pages, handwritten in a foreigner's version of English. This guy had a lot to say to me. He told me, first off, that 80% of the town of Viltz Luxembourg got leveled at the end of the war, it got caught in a crossfire of the Americans trying to get the Germans the heck out. The, the, the civilians that survived needed to live underground in a cellar or in a, in a basement. The school got bombed and destroyed, hospital completely destroyed, 80% of it just gone. I didn't know this because we had moved on. The letter writer then went on to say that after the war, they rebuilt brick by brick the entire town the way it was. And the city leaders decided that they would never forget what the Americans had done for their kids at the middle of World War II. And they decided with their vow that they would never forget that they would create a new tradition. And that new tradition would be that every year, one person from the town would be honored with the title of the American Saint Nick. They would dress up like me, and then they would follow the Jeep ride that I took through their town on that day when we brought a little bit of joy back to the kids. The writer, then went on to say that he'd been looking for me for years. It was his life obsession. He didn't have my name, but he did have a few pictures. And he sent letters to the army 
the American embassy. He'd even he'd even stop American tourists who he'd see going through Viltz and show them the picture and ask if they knew me. Now, that ended up being the way that he connected to somebody to connect to somebody to get my name and address. <laughs> this, of course, was all back in the dark ages before Google. And then he told me the point of the letter. He asked me if I would return that December to play St. Nicholas. He wanted to know if the original American St. Nick would return. Well, well, I, I, I ran up to my attic and got out my army footlocker and started thumbing through my photos. And that day came back like it had happened last week. Whoosh. What you got to understand is that I didn't spend any time thinking about the past. We fought the war to live in the peace, to get on with our lives. In fact, at our reunions for our unit, nobody even ever talked about that day in Viltz. To us soldiers, and I gotta be honest, it was just another day at war. We saw more towns than a traveling circus. for the people of Viltz that day? I rebuilt my life after the war by raising a family while the town of Viltz rebuilt brick by brick and turned me into a symbol. Yes, yes, I would return and I would bring my family with me. Well, they had me arrive by helicopter. <laughs> and, and, and the most amazing thing was it looked exactly as the way that I remembered it. They rebuilt it so well, you'd never know that it was all wiped out. I was wearing the costume. They had me go through town in a parade, waving, waving. <laughs> I'd never signed more autographs in my life. Then there were two women at one point who were walking toward me smiling like they knew me. Turns out they were the two girls from the local girls' school who were my angels, rode with me in the Jeep when we brought back St. Nick. <laughs> They were now grown women themselves with their own kids. Then they surprised me by having my, my best friend in the war, my roommate, Harry Stutz, the guy who was the grand producer and mastermind behind the American Saint Nick. It was like, it was like I was living in a Hollywood movie. They then invited me back every year, and I went many, many times. One year, they made me an honorary citizen of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Another year, they dedicated a statue to me in a park in Viltz. You can tell it's me because in one hand, I'm holding on to my helmet. <laughs> And they've got my glasses on that statue as well. And then on one of the last trips back, when I was on oxygen and had, and had a cane, they gave me Luxembourg's highest military honor, not for killing Germans, but for doing something kind for their children. Thank you. What an incredibly moving story. Thank you, Patrick, for sharing that with us. It's tell, uh, stories like that that really come in handy at this time of year when we're all lacking a little bit of that Christmas spirit, especially under the circumstances. Um, so 
continuing that tradition and that legacy is something that we can all uh, relate to and you know, remember for our own families this holiday season. Um, we are coming to where we would typically stop the live streams. We usually try and keep them about 45 minutes, um, but we're gonna stay on to do a little bit more with Patrick. I would just like to let you know of a few things that are coming up for us at Heritage Center. Um, we've got a few virtual things that we're going to be offering and lots and lots of exciting announcements coming in the new year. Um, this weekend, particularly, we are featuring a B-Twins live stream holiday concert. If you go to our Facebook, you can find all of the details there. UD students, if there are any of you watching, you should check your email and uh, you will find that you have a special promo code so that you can get a discounted ticket. For regular people, the tickets are only $10 and the ticket is one ticket per device. So you can watch with your whole family on one device for only $10, um, and it's gonna be a great show. They're airing that tomorrow, December 18th, December 19th, and on Christmas Day, December 25th. So we hope that you can tune in and see that. Um, I'll let Tom and Patrick come on and wrap things up because I know Tom will have a few more announcements. Um, but that's it for me. If you can't stay with us any longer, thank you for tuning in. Um, but we hope you can because there's more good stuff coming up. So here's Tom and Patrick. Hang in there, everybody. We hope you can stay with us. It's kind of a bonus and a, a treat to have Patrick on here as long as we as long as we can. But we promise we'll be staying under an hour here. So hang hang on there with us. That, I, I was not aware of that story of the American Saint Nick. So that was very revealing for me and really appreciate knowing that. I don't know if you're aware, we got a little town in our area they call Little Luxembourg. No, I didn't know that. It's a town called Saint Native, so another thing. Um, a little, little hamlet and some very rich history there of where the folks from Luxembourg settled in Iowa. So that's just on the road a few miles. From huh. Dubuque. So when, next time you come to Dubuque, which we hope, and that's actually something I wanted to say, is that this this sequel to the accidental hero called "Waiting for the Angels." Um, perhaps sometime in the future, we'll be able to host you again and have you do that do that show at the Heritage Center. I'd love. Um, to we, we would love that. We're trying not to give too much of it away tonight. Um, <laughs> they're just seeing what I, they're going to end up seeing. Maybe twenty minutes of of the performance. And is it a full ninety minute show, kind of like your accidental hero, or? Something yeah, like I, I I might trim a little bit of it. It'll be at least it'll be between seventy and ninety minutes. Okay, and I think I alluded earlier that there's actual film footage from from your grandfather's collection that's part of that show as yeah. well. Yes, my grandfather's footage, and then also there's wonderful army footage of the accidental of of the uh, uh, American Saint Nick story. Okay. Okay. So you well, see them handing out the donuts and the and the candy, and he's there tapping the kids on the forehead and the whole bit. It's wonderful. Well, it's wonderful. Very warm. This, this is just great, uh, great stories for the holidays, you know. And that's what that's what this is all about. So I know you've got one more piece for us tonight. Before we dive into that, and you give us a little back backdrop on the on the on the last story, I just want to thank you again for joining us here tonight. I know that. You're doing this out of the goodness of your heart. And like we said earlier, you've had a very busy day. So thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for doing this. Our audiences really appreciate it. I will mention to our audiences, they probably saw a little commercial before this stream started that uh, if you care to help out the Heritage Center during these interesting times we're going through, we do have an ongoing Friends of Heritage Center campaign that help us continue to bring you these live stream events and eventually hopefully real onstage events as well. Um, so you just go to the Heritage Center website, dbq.edu slash Heritage Center, and you'll find Friends of Heritage Center there. But again, we, we really appreciate you doing this. I had something kind of funny, kind of an observation, Patrick, and that is, has anybody ever told you that you look like Bill Pullman? Do you know who he is? No, who's Bill Pullman? Bill Pullman. The only movie reference I can give you is uh, he was in a movie called While You Were Sleeping, which some of our viewers may have have seen that movie, but check that out because it has a kind of a nice holiday story <laughs> to it as well. While you were sleeping, how, how do you spell how do you spell Pullman? P U L L M A N. He's been in many movies. I mean, I, I can't say I'm a huge fan of his, but I think he's good in that movie. Um, but you look, you have a resemblance, and actually, kind of your style and your mannerisms and your acting kind of remind me of him too. So <laughs> that should be a compliment. 
hook him up. So, I will. Thank you. And, and it's okay. been my it's been my pleasure, Tom, to do this. I'm I am honored to be able to do it. Uh, I I love being at, at at the University of Dubuque. I love that place that you put me up in across the street. That, that oh, wonderful yeah, old yeah. house. The University Guest House. Yeah, we've uh, many a performer that we put up there says the same thing. So I'm glad you, glad you enjoyed that. It's a little the best. little hometown hospitality spin yeah. that we put on things. So, well, your last piece is a little bit of a diversion, right? It, it actually does it have anything to do with with uh, veterans or with um, military, or is it a totally separate sort of story? I'll, Here, let you, I'll let you take it from there, and I just want to let audiences know that we're gonna end with Patrick's piece. So Eleni nor I will come back at the end. Patrick will say what he wants to at the end of, of the of the session. Um, but we're gonna end with this and it's it's the Grinch who stole the Mayo Clinic, right? <laughs> Actually, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something different. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to do, since, since you've seen now the, the sort of the two World War II stories from okay. World War II, I'm gonna do the, the piece that that connects it uh, directly to me and the family because okay. the, the the whole song I'll be home for Christmas. There's the home front, and then there are are those that are away from home. So this will be talking about the home front, and then and then my personal connection. So I'll be doing this just as me, the narrator of this, and about my grandfather. And and it, in the show, it comes right after that first piece that I did. So he's he's recounting his conversation with with the uh, uh, chaplain and that uh, and and how moving it was for him to have been at that at that service and he carried it with him the rest of his life. We'll save the Mayo Clinic story for them to see the real live show, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Great. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, and in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I had no idea that my grandfather had lived through that. We didn't find his writings until 20 years after he died. I had spent every Christmas Eve at his house from age zero up until age 19 when he died. And not once in that time did I ever think that grandpa could have spent anywhere for Christmas but his home, his home in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. He and grandma had seven kids. I was one of their 31 grandkids. And they would, we would all pile into their house for platters of food, Christmas cookies. There'd be crying babies, cigarette smoke, spilled drinks, presents, the best dang party of the year. In grandpa's living room, there was, there was a case on the wall. And in that case, would, he would display all of his medals from his war service. But he never talked about the war. I used to beg him, I'd say, Grandpa, tell me a war story. And he'd say, ah, you don't want to hear about that. And then that would be it. So during his Christmas party, every year I'd pick my spot where I would go downstairs into his furnace room where he kept all of his war souvenirs. So I'd open that door, close it behind me, and there was hardly a sound other than the rumble of that furnace. Upstairs was as noisy as a hot Saturday night, but inside there, I'm taking my time going through his pistols and his knives and his uniforms. And I used to make up a war story about every one of them. Then I would make my way back upstairs and rejoin the party. Now, I imagine that my 
great uncle John Boutnick was there, but I don't ever remember meeting him or seeing him. He was, he met my grandfather while they were in the Battle of the Bulge. In fact, they together shot down a plane, but in fact, I've got movie footage of it that Grandpa had shot of the two of them together. But he and his four brothers, five, five total brothers of my grandmother's who were also in the war, they all came back alive and they all looked the same to me, <laughs> like old crows on a garage roof. Grandpa, though, every Christmas, oh my goodness, it was like he turned into Santa Claus's brother. He would be running around doing these, these, these hand puppets for his grandkids, playing songs on the piano by ear, and just having a wonderful time. And I bet you that every single year he thought about that Christmas that he spent in that bombed out basement in Belgium in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, not knowing if he was ever going to come home. That day, I believe, touched me directly by what I considered the greatest party of the year. The only bad thing about that party was it had to end. So we'd go and we'd put on our coats and our hats and our scarves and we'd walk out into the cold to my dad's frozen car. Dad only bought used cars and he only bought them in the summertime when he didn't care if the heater worked. And then he would take the long way home. We would go down to River's Main Street, which they called Christmas Tree Lane, because on Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve alone, they turned off all of the streetlights. And the only lights that shineth were the Christmas decorations. A couple of times, we hit Christmas Tree Lane right in the middle of a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Dad would slow the car down to a crawl when we got at the corner of Schrader's department store. I'm, I'm in the back seat with my presents on my lap, the car heater kicking out nothing but noise, and outside, millions of snowflakes dazzling in those colored lights like they were flakes of opal. Just gorgeous. When I graduated college, I moved to New York City. And I would attend in person every year the lighting of the Rock Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And let me tell you something. New York is such a disappointment after you've spent Christmas Eve on Christmas Tree Lane in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, in the middle of a blizzard. Thank you. <laughs>